session of the study of the amazing church at Ephesus. Today we'll be starting in chapter 3 verse 14. This is a prayer that Paul actually began in chapter 3 verse 1. There in 1 he says, for this reason I, Paul the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, and he says somewhat parenthetically what he means by being a prisoner for the Gentiles. He points out in 3.2 that his apostleship to the Gentiles was a gift of God. And then in 3.8-11 through 11, he says that his calling was to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. In 3.12 he said that both Jew and Gentile now have boldness and access with confidence to God through Christ. And so in verse 14, chapter 3, 14, uh, he just starts over. He tells them in 13, don't lose heart because of my imprisonment. Doesn't mean the gospel is powerless. In fact, it is taking nothing but giving it more power as now he is able to preach to more Gentiles in the city of Rome. So he says, in fact, it's to your glory. But we start now uh, in chapter 3 and verse 14. He just starts over with the prayer. For this reason, and we discussed what the reason was, everything that he had said before uh, last week. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Uh, this is actually his second prayer in the book of Ephesians. All of these prayers are called prison prayers and they can be found in other prison epistles but it's the second prayer that we see in Ephesians the first chapter verses 15 through 23 he prays that they have wisdom that they may know God better and that they may know the hope of the rich inheritance that is theirs in Christ so now he kneels in prayer I kneel uh, before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I bow my knees. Now this reminds us of some things about prayer that's noteworthy. While Jesus teaches us about the model of the right way to pray in Matthew 6, 9 through 13, uh, Ephesians teaches us even more about the specifics, uh, literally repeating the model prayer outline that Jesus gave, and, but it's a lesson itself, the whole letter of Ephesians, on prayer. He kneels in prayer. That brings up the posture of prayer. Uh, Luke 22 and 41 says that Jesus knelt in Gethsemane. And then in Matthew 26, 39, it explains that later he fell prostrate on his face before God. So what is there about posture in prayer? Well, it says something. It in kneeling in prayer, you are showing that you are subject to the great power that you are approaching. Uh, to fall prostrate before that power is definitely a sign that you are completely uh, hopeless and helpless in your own power and you're asking God or the power that you are prostrating before uh, to assist you or help you. But there are other ways in which uh, people have been recorded in scripture in posture in prayer, uh, continuing about kneeling in prayer, Peter sees Dorcas has died in Acts the ninth chapter in verse 40, and he sends all out of the room, and he kneels in prayer as he brings her back to life through God's power. In Acts 20 and 36, Paul calls for the elders at Ephesus, the same city that we're studying about uh, in, in this letter, of course, to the Ephesians. He calls for them to come down to Miletus, at the end of his third missionary journey so that he may see them one more time. And before he sails back to Palestine, he knelt down and prayed with them all, all the elders. Interestingly enough then, just a little further in the leg of that journey, 
he lands at Tyre. Tyre and Sidon are uh, cities of, uh, of sin as described in the Old Testament. It receives condemnations. But here as he uh, has the opportunity to uh, stop at Tyre because his ship docks there, he finds brethren and he stays with them for seven days. And then the men and women and children of that congregation accompany him to the ship as he sails further south down the Mediterranean ghost, go, coast. And he, uh, he knelt down with them and prayed. He, he knelt with all of them and prayed. Well, you remember Daniel 6 and 10, how even after King uh, uh, Deiris said that no one should ask anything except of him, he was uh, actually trapped into that by some governors who were jealous because the other two governors that were over the kingdom with Daniel saw how powerful he was, and the king actually had in mind giving Daniel all authority of the whole nation. And so they set this trap because they knew Daniel would be uh, completely uh, loyal to his God in prayer. And surely enough, Daniel, knowing the law, still, the record says in chapter 6, verse 10, knelt before his window to God in prayer three times a day, as was his custom. Uh, then there are other postures of prayer. Solomon stood when he prayed to dedicate the temple, First Chronicles 17, 16. And, of course, standing is a display of uh, acknowledgement of, of authority or great power. Perhaps we've all been in the court when the judge enters and the bailiff says, all stand. Uh, I can imagine you stood because the law of the land demands that we show that uh, we are subject to that law. Uh, chivalry used to be that when women would enter the room or leave a table, the men would stand. Uh, somewhere we've lost that, haven't we? But the point is that we stand to say something. And in this case, Solomon stood as he prayed to dedicate the temple. Thus, it is a acceptable, in fact, an encouraged posture of prayer. But more important than the posture of prayer, of course, is the content. And here in Ephesians, we see how Paul builds on the model prayer of Jesus Christ recorded in Matthew 6 and indicates how we can be very powerful in prayer. My study of today's lesson is entitled The Amazing Power That Works in Us. And that is all centered and on the foundation of prayer of the, of the Christian. And we're going to talk about that and the parts of prayer. <clears throat> First of all, we might describe the invocation. Now, I know that's a word that came up probably a thousand years after the New Testament times. Uh, but it is very indicative of what we are doing. To whom do we pray and what do we say or have in mind as we approach God in prayer? Uh, here, of course, he says in verse 14, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's to whom he is praying. As Jesus said, when we pray to God, our Father which art in heaven. Uh, so we invite, we invoke the presence of God uh, as we pray. We come into his presence, but we invite him and invoke his power and his authority to be over this petition of prayer. Uh, so the first part of this is an invocation. And uh, he says he is praying to the Father. And yet, as we read further into the scriptures of Ephesians, we find that he prays through Jesus Christ to the Father. Let's note that in the fifth chapter in verse 20. Again, he talks about praying to God, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that our prayers should be uh, addressed to the Father. That's the invocation. God, attend to my prayer. Listen to my prayer. 
from the ends of the earth I cry out to you, uh, Psalm 61, and attend to my prayer. So we are asking God, but it is through the name of Jesus Christ, meaning what? Of course, that he is mediator and that he brings our petitions, our supplications before the Father as our high priest. So we pray in the name. I want to read that again, 5 and 20. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But there's another thing that perhaps we've too long overlooked. And that's taught in chapter 6 and 18. A simple statement, but what does it mean? Chapter 6 and 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit in the spirit what does that mean well I disagree with Mr. Robertson who paraphrased the message because he gives that as an indication that we should encourage one another's spirits and that's a good idea but I think it misses totally what is meant here we are to pray in the spirit the word pneuma is used in other places in this same letter and is translated the Holy Spirit, or simply the Spirit with a capital S. And so we need to understand here that that's what it means. For instance, it's the same uh, word that is used in 316, just a little later on in our same text. Uh, he says, above all, I'm sorry, here we go. Above all, taking the shield of faith, I'm in 6, sorry, 316, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. And the same word there, spirit, is translated, pneuma, translated to spirit. Actually, pneuma, wind. But uh, in this application, uh, given a capital S, it means the Holy Spirit, of God. So in our text today, if we understand that we are to pray, we are to pray through the Spirit. In 518, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Same word. And we know that that means that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So we are to pray to the Father through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, though? Perhaps we can look at other scriptures to help us understand, and the most powerful in my mind is Romans, the 8th chapter, beginning with verse 26. The whole chapter is given to many things about the Spirit, but in verse 26... Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Now, the Spirit helps us in many ways in our weaknesses, but particularly, Paul says that he helps us in that we do not know what we should pray for. He continues, But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, the New King James says, or with words which cannot be uttered. So the Holy Spirit has the ability to go before God as an intercessor in our behalf. And it is often in ways that we do not even know how to express in words. So it's important to pray in the Spirit. He continues a, 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 a bit of explanation verse 27 now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is in other words god who searches hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is they're one because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of god that's romans 8 27 the spirit makes intercessions for the saints according to the word of god so it's very important that we include the Spirit in our prayers because we want to pray to the Father through Jesus Christ in his name 
and with the Spirit because the Spirit knows the will of God and God knows the Spirit and so the Spirit intercedes for us to ask for things in ways we do not even know how to ask. So we need to invite the Holy Spirit into our prayers. I think we also ought to note that as he begins the second part of what I call prayers, the intercessions, that it's important to know what he is praying about. I should mention first in verse 15 uh, that as he continues his invocation for God, he uses an expression of Again, something that perhaps I've misunderstood in my early teaching and preaching years. He says <clears throat> in verse uh, 15 that God, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. Now, that's the King James and New King James. <clears throat> but almost every other translation will give that from whom every family on earth is named, in heaven and on earth. Um, so I used to use that as teaching that uh, we could call the church the church of God. Now, that's a scriptural name because it's given in other places in scripture as a descriptive term or as a name for the church. <clears throat> but to use uh, Ephesians 3, 15, it does not mean that the whole family in heaven and on earth means the church. No, it means every family, meaning God is the father of all. In fact, if you would look at chapter 4 and verse 6 in discussing the unity, he ends up by crowning it with that which gives all unity is God. One God and father of all. One God and father of all. Not just the church, but of all. Meaning, creator, he's the father of all life. He's the father of plant life. He's the father of animal life. He's the father of uh, man and life in him. And so this is part of the invocation. We are approaching God whom we recognize as the father of all, from whom every family derives its name. Now then, as we go on to verse 16, we begin what we, I will call the petitions of the prayer. What are we asking for? And I think here again we have a great lesson to learn. Most times we will ask for physical blessings, maybe even first. And I think this, the model prayer and this book of Ephesians teaches us that we should have greater uh, targets for our prayer than physical blessings. It should be for spiritual needs. Uh, in the model prayer, Jesus says, pray in this manner, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the invocation. And then he says, thy will or your will uh, be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a spiritual request. What he's actually teaching us to do is to pray that may your will be accomplished on earth as it is in heaven and it begins with me may your will be accomplished in my life may your will be accomplished in my home as it is in heaven may your will be accomplished in this church as it is in heaven in this state and nation and world as it is in heaven we need to be praying for instance for the lost in our city it's a part of a, a spiritual request which should come first and underlined as the most important. It's, uh, it's a part of prayer that perhaps, again, we've overlooked. And we need to ask for spiritual blessings. So as he begins this prayer, he's asking for spiritual blessings for the Ephesians. Let me ask you this. If you were uh, stranded and having to walk across the desert for 20 miles uh, and you're just about to lose consciousness, you're dehydrated, and you fall on the edge of a of a highway that you've come to and uh, a car stops and you're still conscious and that person comes up and you you look up and you see him and you say please and he says yes and you say please give me some new shoes I have holes in the soles of these and by the way it's nine and a half 
and in my case, very narrow, if you will. Or I fell in the desert and, and I broke my watch. It's, it's just a Timex for 1995. You can get a new one for me at, at Walmart. Is that what we would ask for? No, we would ask for life. We would say, please, water. We would ask for that which is our life. And so in the prayers which we offer to God, we ought to ask for life. What we need most is spiritual blessings. In this land of plenty, even in this time of a, of a dire need in COVID-19 attack, uh, we need to still ask for spiritual blessings. Yes, we would be correct and, and should ask for delivery from, from this virus. But we must ask first and foremost for that which we need most, which is spiritual blessings. And so the petition is what we are going to start reading with here in, uh, in the next verse in chapter 16, uh, chapter 3, verse 16 that he, God, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened in the inner man through his spirit. There again, the Holy Spirit. Your request before God should be that you would be strengthened in the inner person, in the soul, by the Holy Spirit. In other words, uh, that the power of the Holy Spirit would be in us. Uh, strengthened with might is my new King James, but in other translations, NIV and such, it will say strengthened with power. Uh, that same power, for instance, that was used to describe what God was doing in Christ in chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 19 He is praying that you should know the inheritance of the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So there's an amazing power that should be in us and it should be strengthened through the Spirit. And we should be praying for that, longing for that and seeking to increase the power of the Holy Spirit in our daily walk and in our actions in every way. And so he is asking for the Ephesians, and we should ask for ourselves, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might or with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Verse 17 says, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and, second part, he's wanting you to be strengthened by the Spirit in the inner man so that Christ would dwell in you. In other words, those two are synonymous. When we are strengthened by the Spirit in the inner man, Christ's presence in our life becomes more powerful more noticeable, more felt, more expressed. So we are strengthened by might, by power of the Holy Spirit, so that Christ can come and dwell in us. And then as his petitions continue, he expands on what that brings next. That Christ, verse 17, may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted in and grounded in love. Would you think of love as something powerful? Of course, we know it is, but why? It's our very root. We're grounded in love. If we think again about the Holy Spirit <clears throat> coming, <clears throat> excuse me, to reside in us, we are reminded that the fruit of the Holy Spirit and Galatians 5 and 22, which is the first word mentioned as the fruit? Love. So the first thing you notice about the fact that you're allowing the Spirit to guide your life would be that you'd be rooted 
and grounded in love. The root meaning that that's where your spiritual life comes from. And what it produces is first noticeable in love. So in the petitions that he is giving for the Ephesians that you and I should pray for, <clears throat> we are strengthened with the Spirit that through that strength of the inner spirit, Christ would dwell in us and that that would cause us to be rooted and grounded in love. God is love. And God and Christ show their love toward us in our salvation. Then, verse 18 and 19. Further invocations, uh, I'm sorry, further requests are made to God. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That's an interesting uh, request to, to know what cannot be known. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, I think it means that we, that we might be able to comprehend, to grasp, and know that Christ's love for us is great, immeasurable. Uh, th that we might comprehend and understand its, its length, its depth, <clears throat> its height, its, its breadth in other words that it is immense and in truth in the sense <clears throat> it is unknowing means that no matter how much we learn about Christ's love even with the strength which God's spirit provides there's always more to grasp we'll never totally comprehend it and, and that's a a very comforting thought to us that not only did he give himself on the cross for us but that he continues to love God continues to love there's a song that's on the praise and harmony uh, the resurrecting God called reckless love and some don't like that word reckless uh, it should never be a, called uh, reckless if it comes from God <clears throat> well listen to the words of the chorus oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you gave yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Really, this is just telling again the story, for instance, of the prodigal son. We call him the prodigal because he was lavish in his spending, just spending all without thought, uh, letting it all go. Well, actually, some commentators say that we could call that same teaching in Luke, the 15th chapter, uh, the prodigal God. That sounds terrible, but what it means is that when the son comes home, God lavishes or the father lavishes his son without holding it back in any way. Uh, he doesn't count the cost. He gives him full forgiveness and, and full reinstatement as a child of his, even though the prodigal son says... I'm not even worthy to be called your child. I just want to be a servant here. No, put the robe on him. Find shoes for his feet. Put the ring on his finger. Uh, he is uh, showing a God that is totally uh, immeasurable in his love and forgiveness. And how indeed that does increase our joy that God is ready to forgive any time that we ask. John teaches us in the first chapter, verses 7 through 9, how important it is to walk in the light as he is in the light. And the blood of Christ keeps on cleansing us from all our iniquities. So not only on the cross for the sins that we are forgiven of when we're baptized, but in our daily walk when we stumble, Christ, his blood, is cleansing us from all iniquity. Well, finally... <clears throat> The part of the prayer that is also so very, very powerful uh, is what I would call the uh, benediction or the giving out of a, of a blessing. In fact, many have called this a doxology, uh, meaning that he is bestowing upon them uh, here as he completes this particular uh, thought. Now, verse 20. To him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above 
all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Uh, the benediction or this blessing that he's talking about presents a God who is able. God is able to do anything. Nothing is impossible with God. He is the creator. He spoke and the world began and the universe was created. But here he's saying that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now that's quite a challenge to us. What it means is that if we're really to understand and receive the power of God, we have first to think of the things which we really need, the spiritual things. And then we must ask for them because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So again, when we start prayers, let's include the salvation of the lost of our city because God is able to give exceedingly abundantly above through his providence and through his blessings of our efforts because it is through us that he decides to work or has decided to work. It is, it is through us that all of this power is finally expressed to mankind. Looking uh, even at the last verse uh, of, of the third chapter, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And a part of the glory that comes through Christ to him is, of course, through the body of Christ, the church. As we give through the power that God is giving to us, as we give to others his love, his service, as we serve others, then God is going to be glorified. And it comes to us as this wonderful way in the, the fullness of the one who is the creator is working in us. Uh, again here, <clears throat> according to the power that works in us, the end of verse 20. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. To all generations. Meaning the inhabitants of the earth. Forever and ever. And so God has chosen a wonderful blessing that comes to us. This wonderful power that can be placed in us by the Holy Spirit. By putting first the spiritual needs of ourselves and of our city and by then allowing God to work through us to accomplish his will. So I hope that this will challenge you that God's desire to accomplish the fullness of himself is that we have the ability and the opportunity to work his will to generations upon generations. Uh, in verse 19, this concept of fullness of God. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And God desires that he be fulfilled through the church that will bring him glory. Pray for this power. Seek this power. And when we pray, pray to God in the name of Jesus Christ and in the Spirit that we will be able to accomplish exceedingly abundantly above what we have formerly thought and asked. God bless you, and we'll see you again next week. In the fourth chapter, we'll be talking about an amazing unity and what constitutes that great unity in Christ? God bless. How sweet, how heavenly is